Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Holy, holy is He. Sing a new song to Him who sits on heaven's mercy seat. sharp it's good to see you all and hear the people popping in and first up today and i'm glad to see her is cassiana trim god bless you cassiana it's good to have you here with us this morning we'll see you often and it's wonderful when we get a chance to and miss sherry is up there and miss carolyn god bless cynthia is all alone again today the boys are out in the dirt again, but they're on top, and that's good, not under. There's Miss Pam. Hope you're feeling better today and that the pain is diminished. And Miss Donna, good morning to you with a nice smiley face as we get ready to get ourselves up, rolling, and going this morning. I pray you've had a great week and uh, uh, a wonderful night. And I, I pray that you just, every time that we come together, that you come just open for whatever it is that God wants to say to you. It may be just that one thing. In the midst of the study, one thing will pop up. That'll be your aha moment for you, or it'll be that, oh, you know, something that God is just nudging you with. And make sure in your journals, and I pray that you keep them. I pray that you keep uh, uh, the notes and journals. You can go back and see what God is doing and how he's working in your life through that period of time. I was up this morning bright and early and well, I don't know it was very bright, but it was certainly early, and had had just a, a, a great, great time this morning, and uh, time where I could uh, pray for you all and uh, and think about what God is going to do with us today, in the day that He has given us. Yesterday, our discussion centered around uh, factors that led to the rapid decline and destruction of the Babylonian Empire, which fell to the Medes and Persians just 23 years after the death of Nebuchadnezzar. And for uh, those of you that may not know where we're at, we're in the fifth chapter of Daniel. Daniel in the fifth chapter. So uh, you want to go there. We're going to be going through much of that chapter today, almost in a narrative form and adding bits and pieces as we go along. We also looked at the sin that really brought the ultimate and immediate judgment upon Belshazzar and all of those uh, in that uh, uh, banquet hall that night. You see, they had profaned, uh, profaned the, the very name of the Most High God by using the gold and silver vessels from the temple for common and wicked purposes. Uh, they were drinking their wine out of them and boasting and toasting to the various gods of gold and silver and uh, and and iron bronze and iron and wood and uh, and earth these vessels you'll remember 
were under what is a term is harim or a ban that could so they could only be used uh, for God's purposes and to do otherwise would be to invite God's judgment to fall on them uh, as was in the case of Achan back in Joshua uh, after he stole some of the things that were under a ban under harim from Jericho not only did it cost Israel their first uh, defeat in the conquest of the land, but it also uh, uh, cost Achan and his entire family their life. Now, as we come back from prayer, we're going to be continuing through this very transformative night, uh, starting uh, with verse 5 and moving on forward. Father, we thank you that uh, we are here today together together to, to hear a word from you. And I pray, Lord, that you will open our ears and our eyes to your word today, that we may uh, come with expectant hearts, knowing that your desire is to meet with us and speak to us, to give us guidance, direction, that your word is powerful, it's instructive, it's God-breathed and is given to us for, for instruction and for uh, correction for reproof and for training in righteousness. So Lord, we come with those four, uh, uh, those four purposes in mind this morning. If you've got a word of instruction for us, Lord, we want to hear it. If it's a word of correction to, to set our steps right, we want to hear that. If there is a word of reproof in there, we need to hear that as well as well as being trained in, in the works of righteousness. Father, we love you with all of our heart. And we just surrender ourselves up to you this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. As we move forward, we're going to move into that very well-known scene taught. You probably heard it in your first years in Sunday school or, or vacation Bible school or wherever. It was the handwriting on the wall. This is the scene. You know, I think just about every child uh, knows at least three stories out of Daniel. They know the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace. They know about the, the hand that came out of nowhere and wrote the, three, the, the four words on the wall. And they know about Daniel in the lion's den which comes up in the next chapter. But uh, let's take a look at what is said here. In verses 5 through 9, it says at this very moment, the figure, fingers of a human hand, good morning, Miss Terry, uh, appeared and wrote in the plaster on the royal palace wall opposite the lampstand. The king was watching and uh, the back of the hand that was writing. Now, it would be a rather startling thing, don't you think, uh, uh, to be reveling and having a great party and then out out of nowhere this this hand comes out and begins to scratch no body attached to it just an embodied hand coming out of nowhere scratching onto the wall and writing something uh, all the color drained from the king's face and he became alarmed uh, well I would do the joints of his hip gave way and his knees began to knock together and the king cried out loudly to summon the astrologers and the wise men and the diviners and there's Miss Sue good morning Miss Sue it's good to see you up here with us this morning knowing the power uh, of Babylonian kings. I'm sure Belshazzar must have seen a lot of men stand in fear, trembling before either his grandfather or his uh, uh, uncles or his father or even himself as a powerful king of Babylon or co-regent in his case. And now it was his turn to tremble. Uh, in that torch-lit banquet hall, the revelry had reached its peak, and doubtless with loud boasting and toasting and laughter and celebration, and all of a sudden, uh, you know, the king's up there on the dais, he's on that raised platform, uh, he's the life of the party, perhaps he's the closest to that mysterious hand in the light of a nearby lamp, and uh, one might have thought the king was having a heart attack. Uh, barely able to stand, his face is, is ash and white, uh, his, his entire body is seized with terror. All of a sudden, the raucous laughter is turned to deafening silence. Maybe some some uh, inhales of, of, of gasping or, or shrieking. Maybe some ladies out there, even some men going, oh, 
what is that? You know, that kind of, get a picture. Get your mind there. Draw yourself this picture of what's going on in this drunken party. With all eyes, now we're on the king, and the king's eyes are fixed on the hand as it writes. As a sense of... Uh, I guess foreboding and panic begins to fill the crowd. All eyes turn to this mysterious writing on the wall, and they, they see the same phenomenon the king is, and the king's action alarms everyone that's present. No one can imagine the scene. Now, already affected by too much wine, the king's terror uh, really robs his legs of any strength. Their, their knees are knocking together. The lower part of his body seems to have lost control. The ancient uh, Greek historian Abed, uh, Abedinus uh, records uh, that uh, the, the near contemporary historian uh, uh, Magathenes uh, writes that uh, Belshazzar uh, now, he's, he may not be talking about that, that banquet, but I think you can put the pieces together that Belshazzar lost control of his bowels out of fear of the Medes and the Persians. Uh, gives you an idea of, uh, of the stories, at least, that went around about that night. Of course, Magasthenes isn't there. He's recording uh, what others have said. Uh, but crying out in fear, his speech... Uh, is probably slurred, and the king immediately summons his wise men to come to the banquet hall. And then that you know we go ahead we we go ahead and pick up. It says the king proclaimed to the wise men of Babylon that anyone who could read the inscription and disclose its interpretation would be clothed in purple and have a golden collar placed around his neck and be the third ruler in the kingdom. So all the king's wise men came in, but they were unable to read the writing or make known its interpretation to the king. Then Belshazzar, uh, then King Belshazzar was very terrified and was visibly shaken, and his nobles were completely dumbfounded. Now, what did these words on the wall mean? He needed to know. They're terrified. They're, they're, they're baffled. A uh, tempting reward is offered to anyone who will interpret the meaning of the handwriting on the wall. Now, there are many who think that the king and the others, the wise men, didn't recognize the words. I don't know that that's particularly the case. If they didn't recognize it's the words, it's because their minds were blinded to, to, to be able to, to, to read the words. I, I, I really don't know. But since the words are written in the Arabic language, and they are terms, and we'll get to that at a later time, but they're, they're terms of monetary measurement is what they are. Uh, they're only, and, and there are only three. I think it's more proper to think that uh, they may have recognized the words, but they didn't understand, you know, having put them together, what all of it meant, exactly what was trying to be said through it. It was baffling. It wasn't a full sentence. It was just three words. What could they possibly mean? Well, four words, three words, but they're mene mene are, that's repeated. All right. So unable to sign for the meeting, the wise men, uh, they come and go, and the king's fear and the distress in the crowd begins to intensify, and, uh, and, and everybody is terror-stricken, and, and the commotion becomes, you know, uh, pretty raucous at this point. Now, Natakris uh, makes a recommendation, and that's the next thing we're going to see, is Natakris' recommendation. Now, the, the, the scripture doesn't give you the name. History gives us the name. In, in verses uh, 10 through 12, it says, due to the noise caused by the king and the nobles. So, you know, big hall, big palace, right? But the, the, the terror kind of noises that are coming begins to fill the hallways, and the queen mother enters the banquet room. Belshazzar's, Belshazzar's mother. Nebuchadnezzar's daughter, Nitocris, comes in to see what all the commotion is about. Now, the queen mother doesn't, uh, apparently wasn't uh, invited or didn't, de or didn't want to attend, didn't want to see her son in that kind of condition, uh, the banquet. But eventually these cries become so loud uh, that uh, they reach her ears and she comes to see what the commotion is about. Immediately, her eyes fall on her son and his appearance and his demeanor, and she comes and she tries to uh, to assure him, to to comfort, him, to bolster him, if you will. Uh, yeah, there we go. Uh, 
It says, due to the noise uh, caused the room, I didn't get that all in. She said, O king, live forever. Don't be alarmed. Don't be shaken. Now, in the original Aramaic, according to my, my sources, my lexicons and all of this, the phrase indicates a rather strong rebuke. She's trying to bolster him up, and in doing so, she's kind of rebuking him. It's more in the order of show a little backbone here. You're the king. You know, get a backbone. You know, stand up straight. You know, kind of like a mother saying, okay, stand up straight. Tuck in your shirt. You know, get control of yourself. And that's what she's doing. And she recalls what Daniel had done and recommends that he be called in to interpret the writing. Now, she understands that her father, Nebuchadnezzar, believed in him and believed that he had this very powerful gift. And she says to him, there is a man in your kingdom uh, who has, uh, has within him a spirit of the holy gods. In the days of your father, rather it would be her father, his grandfather, in the days of your father, he proved to have insight, discernment, and wisdom like that of the gods. King Nebuchadnezzar, your father, appointed him chief of the magicians, astrologers, wise men, and diviners. Thus there was found in this man Daniel, whom the king named, uh, Beltesh, renamed Belteshazzar, an extraordinary spirit, knowledge, and skill to interpret dreams, explain riddles, and solve difficult problems. Now summon Daniel, and he will disclose the interpretation. Now, what you don't see in all of this that you see when you, you look at other versions and you look at, at, at uh, the translations more literally, there's a subtle wordplay in the king's uh, queen mother's speech. Daniel, she recalls, is able to solve difficult problems, which the Aramaic phrase is to loosen knots. Uh, so that, that term to loosen knots means literally, you know, you can solve a, 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 a problem that is all tied up in knots. The wordplay comes in from this phrase being used also uh, to loosen in, in verse 6 where it says that the king had his knots loosened, if you will, which is a subtle reference to the possibility, again, that the king had soiled himself. Now, if you look at the expanded Bible, it interprets and highlights verse 6 this way. Let me get it up there for you to see. It says, King Belshazzar was very frightened. The king's thoughts terrified him. His face turned white or pale. His knees knocked together and he could not stand up because his legs were too weak and the strength left his legs. And then his hips went loose. In other words, the knots in his hips loosened. Now the idiom they, they suggest there from the original language relates to the fact that probably uh, Belshazzar had wet himself. He became so frightened that uh, he lost control of himself. Though Belshazzar has lost all his sense of reason, and all of that is there to show just exactly how terrified and how unhinged Belshazzar become by the experience. Worse than Nebuchadnezzar did at the visions that he had and the dreams that he had that Daniel interpreted. The weak queen, however, she keeps her wits about her and shows real confidence in Daniel's ability based on his track record in the history of Babylonian affairs. After all, she grew up in that household. She had a ringside seat in her father's court to see how God used Daniel. Her summary of Daniel's accomplishments, now remember, she's much younger than, than Daniel, so she would have grown up all these years knowing him and seeing him and, and, and hearing the stories about him. Her summary of Daniel's accomplishments in verse 12 suggests that Daniel performed other amazing tasks throughout his lifetime uh, for King Nebuchadnezzar. Those recorded in the book of Daniel really are nothing more than a sampling for us of Daniel's ministry to the king. Kind of like what John says about Jesus at the end of his gospel in John chapter 20, verse 20 and 21. There are many, also many other signs uh, attesting miracles that Jesus performed in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these have been written so that you, uh, that you may believe with a deep abiding trust that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed. 
the Son of God, and that by believing and trusting and relying on him, you may have life in his name. So you see, everything that the Gospels record about Jesus is only a smattering. It's only a sampling of all the things that Jesus said. Now, the, the, the libraries of the world couldn't contain all the work and all the things and all the miracles that Jesus performed in his three and a half years of ministry on this earth. Well, like that, Daniel and what is recorded in Daniel is simply a smatter. Remember, Daniel's been in captivity since he was, you know, 14, 15 years old. By this time, he's, uh, you know, running 80, 85 years old, you know. So, you know, he's he's been around a long time doing a lot of stuff for the king. And he has served each and every one of those kings, and now it's down to Belshazzar. Sadly, we need to observe that the queen mother's confidence in Daniel doesn't seem to have related to any kind of personal faith in Daniel's God. See, she, she refers to Daniel and his great wisdom in pagan terms and makes no reference to, to Daniel's God, the God of, of, of the Jews. She simply refers to his wisdom as having its source in the gods, which is where, remember, Nebuchadnezzar started? until ultimately at the last he makes his incredible pronouncement of the Most High God. Her knowledge of Daniel and of his God is superior to that of Belshazzar, but inferior to that of her father Nebuchadnezzar when you read his final assessment back in the fourth chapter at the end that we've already looked at. Her confidence does seem to produce a calming effect on the king and on the guests. She was a strong personality, apparently, according to history. So the king summons Daniel to appear before him and uh, before all the guests that night. Now, archaeology does confirm the fact that Daniel was an eyewitness to the events during those times. Uh, whether it's speaking of that evening or not, we know that Daniel is there before World War I. German archaeologists found Babylon and discovered it in their excavation. They found the Babylonian banquet hall and, and uh, as they excavated the ruins. And, of course, one thing, when uh, Saddam Hussein was in power, he capitalized on that and uh, began uncovering all of Babylon, and he wanted to restore ancient Babylon. And one of the places he started was with the banquet hall. The banquet hall was 56 feet wide and 170 feet long, with a raised platform for the king's throne to set at the center of the 173-foot section. So he was in the center of, of every one at the end. He was at the center of the longest part of the banquet hall. Now, as they worked to uncover uh, everything in there, they discovered uh, a whole treasure trove of clay tra uh, tablets that are scattered throughout museums in Europe right now. It recorded the fact that Nebuchadnezzar's son, Belshazzar, had indeed, at least on uh, more than one occasion, called for a tremendous feast to be held. And it mentions that Belteshazzar, or Daniel, was among the rulers of the magicians, soothsayers, and Chaldeans at that time. So we have that archaeological evidence to bolster and support what Daniel says. Now, all these people for, for years who said Daniel was a work of fiction, every time they uncover something new in that area, it does from that time period, it does nothing more than confirm everything that Daniel has said. Well, in Daniel 5, verses 13 through 16, it says, So Daniel was brought before the king, and the king said to Daniel, Are you that Daniel who is one of the captives of Judah, whom my father the king brought from Judah? I've heard about you and how there's a spirit of the gods in you and how you have insight, discernment, and extraordinary wisdom. Now, when Daniel arrives, the king is eager to assure himself that this is exactly the man the queen mother had recommended with the credentials that he had to perform the task at hand. His questions all pertain to Daniel's ministry during the reign of his father or his grandfather, Nebuchadnezzar. They will, to some degree, become the basis for which Daniel's indictment of the king's sin is, is levied in the verses that are going to follow. The question then is not whether Daniel demonstrated divine wisdom, but what this king 
did or would do with the knowledge of some wisdom. It goes on. And Nebuchadnezzar says to him, now the wise men, or not Nebuchadnezzar, but Belshazzar says to him, the wise men and astrologers were brought before me to read the, this writing and make known to me its interpretation, but they were unable to disclose the interpretation of the message. See, that rings of his grandfather's words to Daniel as well, doesn't it? Once he makes known to Daniel the failure of all the other wise men in the kingdom, He's asked to do what no other wise men could do. Sound familiar? All having failed before Daniel was summoned. Go back to Daniel chapter 2 and read that whole scene concerning the king's dream. If Daniel was able to fulfill the king's request, there would be a reward. He says to him, he says, however, I have heard that you are able to provide interpretation and solve difficult problems. Untie not. Now, if you're able to read this writing and make known to me its interpretation, you will wear purple, have a gold collar around your neck, and be the third ruler of the kingdom. Now, the king promised him royal clothing, gold necklace, which befitted his new position uh, of, of having direct uh, power you know, directly under him as uh, uh, Belshazzar. Obviously, the king was eager to know what those words meant on the wall. Now, as we move on to the sentence being handed down, Daniel begins this whole scene by turning down the king's reward. He doesn't want any part of it. He doesn't want any part of what Belshazzar has done or, or uh, you know, has been doing or what he intends to do thereafter. But Daniel replied to the king, keep your gifts and give your rewards to someone else. I don't want them. Why would he risk the king's anger by turning down his gift? What an insult. What an insult to throw the gift back into the king's face. And that's what it would have been. It would have been an insult worthy of being put to death. So why would he, why would he do that? Well, Daniel knows that the king's gifts are virtually useless. He knows what that writing means. He knows that his gifts are useless. What good would it do Daniel to be given the third highest office in the administration of Belshazzar when his reign would end abruptly? Daniel was God's servant, divinely gifted to interpret dreams, and he would not prostitute his gift by using it for his own gain. His was a gift of grace, and he would use it that way. Finally, you know, Daniel was not for hire people. He didn't have a business card saying, have profit, will travel. Now, if you're an old television buff or you're just old like I am and you grew up, you know, there was a, uh, 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 Richard Boone played a part of Jack Palatin, you know, in the TV series, have gun, will travel. He had that card and had a gun on it said, have gun, will travel. He was a hired gunslinger. Well, Daniel didn't have a card that said, have profit, will travel. This is what he says to him, though. He says, however, I won't take your gifts. However, I will read the writing for the king and make known its interpretation. Now listen. As God's prophet, Daniel spoke to men for God. He was God's representative. He was not like Balaam, whose ministry could be bought and sold. Later, when the king presses Daniel to take the gifts, he does, knowing that he had faithfully carried out his task. But, well, we're really not told whether he does. We just know that the king bestowed it on him, and we'll get to that tomorrow. But verses 18 through 24 are fascinating. Because in these verses, Daniel explains the guilt of King Belshazzar. More than interpreting the, the, what's on the wall, he spends very little time doing that. Most of it, he explains, explaining the guilt of Belshazzar. You see, the writing of the wall explained in verses 25 through 28 speak of the eminent judgment of God which will fall upon Belshazzar in his kingdom due to his sin. Daniel spends more time on the king's guilt than on his punishment. As he devotes more time to explaining the reason for the writing, then he does his meanings. In verses 18 through 24, they're intriguing verses as well because they focus more on Belshazzar's grandfather, Nebuchadnezzar. Interesting. 
Belshazzar's sin is attributed to his failure to learn from history. Listen, I think that would be a lesson for all of us to take. Do we learn from history? Do we learn from the mistakes we make, from the, from the failures that we have? Do we learn from our successes? Do we learn from, from other people? You know, I was one of those people that, you know, uh, somebody could say, hey, I've been down this road, don't go down this road, but, you know, don't touch that stove, it's hot. And I'd reach out every time just to make sure how hot it really was. How about you? Were you able to learn from others? Or did you always have to do it the hard way? Well, Belshazzar's sin is attributed to his failure to learn from history. You see, the great head of gold was Nebuchadnezzar, the one into whose hand God had given King Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, and brought all of Israel at that point under Gentile rule from then until the coming of Christ. He was the one who brought the vessels of the temple of Jerusalem to Babylon, and under his reign, Daniel's divinely bestowed wisdom became evident and was displayed in various occasions. The queen's mother's words focused on Daniel's wisdom during the days of Nebuchadnezzar. Now, when Daniel rebukes the king, he does so because he's ignored the lessons he should have learned from the past through his grandfather's experience with Daniel and with his God. But he didn't learn them. He was out too busy shooting pool to learn the lessons that he could have learned at the knees of his granddad. It is believed that Belshazzar was around his mid-40s at this time. So assuming that he, would, uh, uh, that he would have been around 17 when Nebuchadnezzar died. So he had ample opportunity to know some of the things for himself firsthand and up close and personal. Now, let's read what Daniel says to you. As for you, O king... The Most High God, El Elyon, bestowed on your father Nebuchadnezzar a great kingdom, greatness, honor, majesty. Due to the greatness that he bestowed on him, all peoples, nations, and language groups were trembling with fear before him. He killed whom he wished, he spared whom he wished, he exalted whom he wished, he brought low whom he wished. And when his mind became arrogant and his spirit filled with pride, he would dispose from his royal throne and his honor was removed from him. Chapter 4. He was driven from human society. His mind was changed to that of an animal. He lived like a wild donkey, and he fed on grass like an oxen, and his body became damp with the dew uh, of the sky until he became he came to understand that El Elyon, the Most High God, rules over human kingdoms, and he points over them whom he wishes. Now, he could have said at this point, you know these things, Belshazzar. You know them. These are stories that have been handed down that uh, you probably even heard from your granddad. You know these things. He says, but you, his son, or grandson, Belshazzar, have not humbled yourself, although you knew all this. See? See? You would not, did not, have not humbled yourself, although you knew all this. Instead, you've exalted yourself against the Lord of heaven, and you brought before you the vessels of this temple. And you and your nobles, together with their wives and concubines, drank wine from them. I want you to think of the implication of all of that, just for a moment. You praise the gods of silver and gold and bronze and iron and wood and stone, gods that cannot see or hear or comprehend, but you have not glorified the God who has in his control your very breath and all your ways. Does that sound familiar? We exalt the gods of uh, chrome and uh, and, and fiberglass, the gods of the flat screen TV, the gods of the sports heroes. We exalt the gods of the movie icons. We exalt the gods of, uh, of, of peyote and, and, uh, and, 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 and all the other stuff. We exalt the gods of materialism and stuff and things. But do we exalt 
and glorify the only God who has control of our very breath and all our ways. You see, do we learn the lesson that Nebuchadnezzar learned? that Belshazzar had the opportunity to learn. He knew all these things. He had this knowledge. But he refused to humble himself before God. The events of Daniel 4 are now repeated as a lesson which not only Nebuchadnezzar learned, but which Belshazzar, his grandson, should have learned as well. History. If we don't learn from it, we will be doomed to repeat it. In one way, that's, that's what is so insidious about this whole cancer culture movement that's going on right now, to erase anything in our history that we might find displeasing or distasteful as if it didn't exist. Well, my friends, if we can successfully change our history, we will be doomed to repeat it over and over again. And if we thought tyranny then was bad, wait till the next tyranny comes. God sovereignly granted Nebuchadnezzar power, glory, majesty, and he exercised that power and authority over man, but his heart became proud and he acted arrogantly and God temporarily took away not only his power, his kingdom, took away his reason, took away his abilities, and he became like a beast in the field eating grass and living in the elements for shelter. In that archaeological discovery, when they uncovered a tablet relating to that time period, when Nebuchadnezzar, remember we shared this the other day, neglected the, you know, the, 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 the people that attended to the king writing to his son and talking about his neglect of his family, this information would have been known to Belshazzar. But paying no attention to what went before, he is doomed to fall prey to the same old sins of pride that his granddad was broken of. All this happened so that he might recognize God as ruler over mankind and recognize that all human authority is delegated to man by God from whom all authority is derived. Belshazzar knew these things and yet he had not learned them. His heart was now proud and haughty like that of his forefathers. He exalted himself against the God of heaven as evidenced in the pro profaning of the holy vessels from within the temple. Not to content to ravel in sin himself, he included others in his sin and, and, and who was shared by, by those who ate and, ate and drank and toasted uh, on the right and left of him all night long. Rather than glorying and glorifying the God of heaven, whom he'd heard about in relationship to his forefather Belshazzar, blasphemed the name of God. Belshazzar had pushed his pride and arrogance further than even his grandfather Nebuchadnezzar had. And this was the reason for the writing on the wall. The blasphemous use of the vessels and the writing of the wall are inseparably related together. You cannot pull them apart. There's a lesson to be learned from this. And it speaks to all people in all places at all times. God's justice will not be held back forever. The day will come that God will set th all things right and we will know that whether, uh, you know, whether it's, it's, you know, we don't know if it's going to be 10 years from now or 10 days, 10 hours or 10 minutes, but we know that day is coming. Belshazzar learns that. Whether this, this prophecy for him, he had no idea whether it was going to be a year from now, 10 years from now, or it could be that evening, which we know it was. Peter writes some words that we need to really, in our day, take greatly to heart that relates to this whole thing. In 2 Peter 3, in verses 3 through 9, he says, Know this first of all, that in the last day mockers will come with their mocking. 
What was Nebuchadnezzar doing? He was mocking the very God of heaven in a, in a most profane way. Well, in our day, people come and there's going to be mockers and with their mocking and following after their own lusts and saying, oh, where's the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it were from the beginning of creation. Can't you hear that ringing out today? We can go on and do what we want to because, you know, <laughs> now for those of us who truly honestly believe that Jesus is going to return, that he is coming back, we take these words to heart. We understand them. But do you think that the populace around us, if I were to say them, you know, they, they make the jokes of the guy walking around in a robe and he's got a long beard and, 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 and tangled hair and he walks around saying the world is coming to an end, the world is coming to an end. We make jokes about that. Guess what, folks? The world is coming to an end. Now, they might not believe that in Moscow. They may not believe that in London or Paris or Berlin. They may not believe that in Washington, D.C. All has continued the same. Our fathers fell asleep and all continues just as it was from the beginning of the creation. For when they maintain this, it escapes their notice that by the word of God, the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of the water and by water through which the world at that time was destroyed, being flooded by water. But the word, but by his word, the present heavens and earth are being reserved for fire, kept for the day of judgment, the destruction of ungodly men, reserved in fire. You know, back in the middle 1800s, a scientist discovered uh, uh, that uh, everything in the world is made up of what he called uh, an atomo. Now, we've de-Latinized that we call it an atom. Tomao means to open up. When you put the A in front of that, it reverses what that means. It means it's impossible to open it up. And what the scientist was saying, he said, if we ever find, oh, you know, we have a thing here called an etomao. We can't really see what's inside it. We can't split it open. If we could, we would find that there would be uh, incredible power and mighty fire that would come out of it. Well, back in the 40s, we learned how to turn a tomao into tomao. We learned how to open it up. But what did they find when they opened up the atom? Anybody? Look at pictures of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. We found that it unleashed great power. And one of the fears that, that these men in the Manhattan Project feared is if they released the atom bomb, would that chain reaction continue? And would it engulf the whole world as one atom bumps against another and splits it open and on goes that chain reaction? Well, one day, I will say it this way. Scripture tells us that by him all things are held together. That means that God holds together, Jesus holds together every atom of this universe, but one day he will just turn loose. And Peter goes on to say that exact same thing later on. We won't look at that today. But he finishes this, but do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved that with the Lord one day is a thousand years and a thousand years like one day. Time means nothing to God. He lives outside time and space. He's outside the box. The Lord is not slow about his promises as some now sold us, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all come to repentance. That's God's heart. That's God's desire. That would have been God's desire for Belshazzar. God was patient until he wasn't anymore. You see, it's a message that even we as a nation need to take to heart. Even as Thomas Jefferson said when he said this, and it's inscribed on the Jefferson Memorial, it's not the whole thing, just a part of, uh, a part of that, that quote that he makes is what's used on that. It says, indeed, I tremble for my country when I reflect that God is just and that his justice cannot sleep forever. That considering the numbers, nature, and natural means only, a revolution of the wheel of fortune, the exchange of situations is among possible events that it may become probable by supernatural 
inference, interference. In other words, God's justice will not sleep forever. Oh, my friends, do we hear the warning in Daniel and chapter 5? I'm pretty we do. Because if there's any that, that hear this lesson and you have not heeded the warning that he gives you, the grace and the mercy in reaching out to you to draw you to himself, don't put it off. Heed the warning. Humble yourself before the hand of Almighty God, the Most High God, El Elyon. We're going to pick up here tomorrow with the interpretation of those words and the rest of the story leading down. May God bless you. Father, I thank you so much for your word, for the mercy and the power that is seen in there. And Lord, there are lessons for us to learn that we should not and must not ignore. Let us hear you, Lord, with open hearts and lives, willing to obey what you show us. Use us today, Lord. Use us for your mighty purposes. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, Janine Kelly. Oh, Janine, God bless. It's good to see you out there. Hope you all got back uh, home safely uh, to Florida. And uh, uh, it's good to have you. Give your husband our love. It's good to have, I hope maybe both of you there, but uh, it, it's good to see. Been praying for you, so I'm glad to see. I, I'm assuming that means that you all got back home to Florida. This is a couple that had visited for a couple of weeks. Great. Visited a couple of weeks while they were out here on vacation. And, uh, you know, we're praying for you guys as well. Praying for your ministry as well. I've been, I uh, uh, looked at your Facebook page, so we're praying for your ministry as well. Thank you for allowing us to get to know one another, and I can add you to my prayer list. God bless. Uh, listen, I'll see you all back here tonight at 6 o'clock as we have our missions uh, mission and, and, and uh, Bible study prayer meeting. Uh, but we'll be back here at 6 tonight and then tomorrow at 9 o'clock. God bless you. Keep loving one another. Love's from God, so when you love, you know, you're, you're doing the work of God. Now, also, may the wisdom of God be multiplied in you today as we go forward. God bless. I'll see you all later.